I'd like to, to thank the organizers for the um, possibility of attending this co conference as well as presenting to you today um, our studies. Uh, what I'll really be doing, I think, is presenting some tools which can be used in synthetic biology. Um, my laboratory hasn't approached this sort of problem from the synthetic biology perspective, though I think we're starting to consider that um, uh, today. So what I want to do is to really give you an overview of, of our studies on making and using gene switches and, and give you some insights how they might be used in synthetic biology to reprogram cells and how we've um, performed um, experiments both in cells and organisms using this approach. So ideally we'd like to be able to reach into cells, um, into the DNA and, and turn genes on and off in a very specific fashion and, and if we can coordinate those types of events we'll be able to do synthetic biology so to teach cells or organisms to perform specific tasks that might be of interest to the engineer or um, med the medicinal chemist or the, the, um, the, the physician um, in the clinic. So to do that one might, might have to recognize a, a rather extended sequence of DNA, and I show about 18 base pairs of, of DNA here. And you might imagine a protein would have to read out the chemical identity of, of those bases over an extended uh, track of sequence if we wanted specificity within the genome, and, and the protein, of course, would use its side chains to read out those chemical identities. Now, it'd have to do so in the, in the context of the, the native structure of DNA we find primarily in cells as it in, encodes um, information before DNA. And so those side chains would have to sit in either the major or the minor groove of DNA. And of course they'd have to function in the context of a globular protein. So what, what I want to do is really to give you an overview of how we can create such proteins that are able to bind and regulate uh, DNA within cells very specifically. And this technology has, has, been, come, has um, been called zinc finger uh, protein technology and it really allows us to turn genes on or off in a very specific fashion. So I'll try to step through these points. I think I'm missing part of my slides here, unfortunately. Um, as uh, quickly, as uh, we only have 30 minutes to give you an overview of how you might be able to use these as tools um, to address um, systems of interest to your own laboratory. Now if one looks at the diversity of uh, protein architectures that nature has, has developed to recognize and control DNA, on the periphery we see some of the more common solutions. That's, uh, these are solutions that utilize dimerization to um, uh, provide a means of recognizing extended sequences and, and attenuating um, gene switches. Now in, in the central position you see a, a, what turns out to be a relatively unique type of protein at least um, from the perspective of, uh, of a bacteria. And this is um, uh, a zinc finger protein. Now it turns out that higher organisms have learned to exploit these types of proteins um, tremendously and, and, and C2H2 zinc finger domains that I'll, I'll consider here today are, are, are among the most coded domains within, within um, the, the human species and as a protein class it's only second to the immun immunoglobulin fold in terms of its usage and other type of um, domain structure that my laboratory has been interested in over, over the years. Now a lot of the fine detailed insight into how these proteins um, interact with DNA have been um, solved here at MIT primarily through the laboratories of, of Carl Pabo. And Carl's uh, laboratory solved this structure which, which led us um, into this area when I saw the preliminary uh, communications of the structures um, back in the early early 90s. And what you can see that's unique about these this, this type of uh, scaffold is that it's not recognizing DNA as a dimer, um, but it's using a very modular um, domain structure to recognize an extended sequence of DNA. Now these proteins recognize only nine base pairs of sequence, but based on its modularity you can quickly uh, imagine how these proteins can be extended to recognize long asymmetric 
sequences. And I think this will be something uh, very easy to understand at MIT because there's probably a very good correlation between attendance and, and use of Lego, Legos uh, as children uh, here. And this is really the, the, uh, the type of approach um, that makes this, this class of proteins extremely interesting, especially um, from an engineering uh, standpoint. Now, the, the domain structure, which is shown here, is a simple beta-beta alpha fold stabilized by chelation of a single zinc ion by the eponymous uh, histidine and, and cysteine residues. Uh, sequence conservation over this motif from, from yeast um, to man is shown here. Um, the red uh, residues showing uh, exact identity. You can see that the tail end of the protein, which is actually this tail end of the, the helix into what I'll call the linker region, which is not shown in this structure, is the most conserved element of the protein. The reading head of the protein, and uh, I'll refer to the reading head as the, the, the portion of the, the protein that the um, domain uses to read out the, the chemical identity of the bases is constrained over a very short sequence from the residue uh, just prior to the start of the alpha helix, I'll call minus residue at, at the minus one position, through six residues in. So this constitutes the reading head of the protein. You see some diversity here as these proteins are recognizing different sequences of DNA. Now it's that focal um, contribution of residues in the reading head that, that allows us to rather quickly engineer these proteins. Uh, what you can see here is that the proteins um, in their more typical mode of recognition use three primary contact residues at positions minus one, the third residue into, into that alpha helix and that, and that sixth residue in, into the helix to recognize primarily a, a three base pair sequence. And now some some zinc finger proteins can re recognize somewhat extended sequences. However, um, if we constrain our ideas of how we want to engineer these proteins, we can, we can think of them as more simple binding machines in that we want proteins that interact with primarily a codon of sequence. And we can train these proteins to recognize these types of sequences. Now, in nature, we see transcription factors typically being used to control collections of genes. So the transcription factors we're used to looking at in, in higher organisms actually have holes in their recognition um, uh, that allow them to recognize consensus sequences and actually work in combination with other transcription factors to control genes. And from Carl's structure, we can see some of the holes in the recognition um, that these native uh, proteins exploit in, in order to, to be able to, to recognize sites within other genes and to regulate them. So for example, finger one of, of this protein makes primarily two direct contacts into its uh, triplet sequence. We'd like to be able to, to make these, to evolve these proteins really to read out each of these um, uh, uh, bases in sequence. And ideally, we'll, we'll be able to avoid some crosstalk between, um, between domains. And if there exists crosstalk, we'll have to learn how to to use them in combination such that that crosstalk can be actually used to, to our advantage. Now ideally, as a synthetic biologist, you want to be able to use these off the shelf. You don't want to have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to construct a uh, transcription factor. So you'd like to be able to have a protein complement of the genetic code. So for each given triplet, you ideally would be able to take a protein domain that we've defined assemble it, and then link those domains together to, to recognize a given DNA sequence. So that means you have to develop now, or I have to develop my laboratory primarily, uh, 64 different domains that, that bind with um, good enough specificity that every time you use these domains, you won't send me a nasty email. And um, I think that we've, we've done this uh, now to a large extent. The 16 ANN and GNN domains um, um, uh, are published in the literature, and we have most of the, the CNN and TNN domains uh, <laughs> residing in the laboratory um, and are being tested. Um, how, did, how did we create those domains? We used a combination of molecular evolution. Um, what you see here is, is a view onto a filamentous phage that we engineered years ago 
to, to allow us to um, evolve antibody fragments, primarily FABs. Um, so you might consider that this actually a synthetic biology structure. It's a filamentous phage displaying an antibody on its surface bound now to hepatitis B surface antigen, which are those little balls um, based on that specific interaction with the antibody. We can use the same type of system now to, to select um, and evolve antibody-based, uh, I'm sorry, uh, zinc finger proteins to bind specific sequences of DNA. In, o in order to do that, we actually display a three-finger protein. Now, where each finger recognizes three base pairs of sequence, we fix the two um, external uh, domains. So those, those two domains are fixed and are recognizing six base pairs of sequence. And then between those, we, we place our novel uh, domain, wherein we randomize over that, confined, that constrained reading head, which is, is what makes this um, ideal. Is that me? For um, this type of system, because we can now encode using oligonucleotides and make a library of about a billion different proteins that allows us to survey completely that reading head on a given domain. And then we can ask that that filamentous phage to bind its nine base pair target, wherein only three base pairs are modified on an oligo uh, in the presence of uh, nearly identical competitor oligos that simply lack the biotin residue that we use for selection. So that allows us to select for um, not only a, a affinity, but specificity, because this filamentous phage ideally would bind uh, this DNA and not any of the other 62 other domains. And then after about 10 rounds of selection, um, one gets uh, consensus sequences, and, and, and these are some of those outputs. Um, I won't uh, have time to go into any of the details in, in terms of molecular recognition of these proteins and their cognate targets, but you can see that um, the sixth, um, the residue of the sixth <coughs> position is primarily involved in, in recognition of, of the five prime base and that all of these contain a G and all of the selected proteins contain an R and there's a bidentate hydrogen bonding interaction that's mediated between the terminal guanidinium group of arginine and that, that G base. Um, so those are the three uh, primary contact positions, but what you can also see from this data is that there's um, strict selection of those residues that provide for the <coughs> stereochemical context that allow allow these key residues to to make um, uh, their discriminating contacts with, with the given triplet as well. So it's really the entire reading head which is necessary for, for fine specificity. And then by using a combination of both those that are derived directly by phage display, it turns out that only about 50% of the proteins uh, that we select using phage display have the characteristics in terms of specificity and affinity that we want for this system. The other 50% have to be uh, essentially engineered using both uh, structural insights, uh, for example, from the work of Carl, as well as the artificial phylogeny we get from, from the biological selection to, pr to prepare proteins that, that bind very specifically. And these are readouts of three finger proteins, so they're binding nine base pairs of sequence, and they're discriminating uh, identical uh, oligos that differ only in that in that that middle triplet. And so they have very um, fine specificity characteristics. Um, we'll skip over um, details of, of molecular recognition, um, but now if when now evolves these domains, and I told you we evolve them in the context of, of, of two other fingers, we can then ask the question, can we readily combine them like Legos to create families of proteins that, that um, bind given DNAs? And you can see the power of this, this um, combinatorial approach when one develops a large family of, of, of these domains. Um, this is a view of 80 such proteins constructed by simply recombining um, defined um, zinc finger domains, and you can see that to, to um, greater than 90 um, uh, percent, these proteins bind um, their targets, which are represented on the diagonals <coughs> of these um, binding assays. Uh, the system's not perfect, um, 
but it's very usable in, in that most of the proteins constructed will bind to the desired sequence with a specificity um, and affinity that's workable within, within the context of gene regulation. Now, nature uh, in single finger proteins primarily uses um, three contiguous fingers uh, to recognize nine base pairs of sequence. That's not enough even to uh, achieve, uh, achieve specificity within the rather small genome of the coli. In order to achieve um, uh, specificity within genomes um, wherein we'd like to, as uh, scientists have an impact on human biology, we really need proteins that re can recognize about 18 base pairs of sequence. Those would uh, constitute six uh, zinc finger domains. Specificity there, you mean you wanted to bind to only one site? Yeah, ideally. Whereas, of course, most human regulatory proteins that are site specific will bind to many other sites, and it won't matter. That's right. So these proteins then would consist of uh, six contiguous domains, um, have the potential to be specific with, within about 20. Uh, human genomes that would allow us to, to really have proteins that can work in genomes that are larger than our own, such as, as, as plants, and have a, have a level of specificity which will allow them to um, ideally be able to, to, to um, singularly regulate a given gene of interest. Now, these, these, one might worry that when one connects these domains together, they, they might actually work in an additive sense in that the the constituent, constituent three-finger proteins um, can bind equally as well to their individual sites as the string of six. And when one uses the canonical linker that we've chosen um, in the laboratory, one can see that these, these additions of, of, of units actually have uh, non-additive effects that work in, to our advantage. And that's seen in this DNA1 footprinting assay. So this is a three-finger protein designed to bind this site at footprints here. But there are other um, identical or near identical sites within this same promoter region. You can see this, this three finger protein is, is, is footprinting um, this um, promoter sequence over this patch as well. Now we'd like to, to be able to build out this protein now with six fingers. And ideally, these types of interactions go away. And what you see is if one matches the protein concentrations um, one sees that we do indeed uh, grow the specific uh, footprint here and lose that ability of the, the constituent halves to interact effectively with their, with their sites. Is now, just your mic here real quick. Oops, thanks. Now, given that we've defined the gene in and in domains in the literature, that allows you to construct over a billion different transcription factors without recourse to phage display or protein engineering. Just taking the, the sequences that we've described in the literature and having those, those genes then uh, synthesized allows you to recognize any RNN sequence where R is either G or A. Um, that really allows you to do most everything you might want to do in the human genome um, uh, in that that provides us with um, about 25,000 switches for every gene that, that, that's predicted. I think this number is going to expand greatly as we begin to appreciate um, uh, RNA genes. Um, but nonetheless, we have at, at this point in time um, the power to hit genes at, at, at many sites. So as proof of principle, we looked at two genes involved in, um, in cancer and uh, breast cancer in particular, the receptor tyrosine kinases, ERB2 and ERB3. What you see in this rather short promoter region uh, with, the, with the, the red and the blue dots, the red, red dots indicate where any of these RNN type proteins might be designed to sit. So you can see that there are a huge number of choices um, available um, to you in terms of where one can simply assemble these proteins um, to potentially impact on, on their regulation. Now, uh, in higher organisms, um, transcription factors uh, typically act with the aid of a, an effector domain. So beyond the DNA binding domain that the zinc finger protein provides us, uh, 
to facilitate repression, we usually use a repression domain. In activation, we use an activation domain. And that allows us really to set this protein either before or after the site of transcription and to, and to regulate uh, that gene. Now, as a challenge to the approach, we, we chose um, two homologous targets in, in these genes. Um, uh, the 18 base pair sites chosen, both of which uh, reside in the 5' prime UTR of these genes are shown here. They differ by only three out of 18 uh, bases, so the challenge was to make a protein that would bind one and regulate it and um, bind the other and regulate it. So the genes can be quickly constructed now um, using this modular assembly approach. You can type it in your computer, have the gene delivered to you, and have that protein um, at hand to test. Now, we typically deliver these into cells using retroviruses and track the, the infection using uh, GFP linked via an, uh, an iris sequence. Now, um, hopefully most of you will be familiar with facts. Um, the, the, the peak on the, on the left hand of all of these charts um, in the stippled line represents the, the um, basal level of fluorescence these cells have as they go through the, through the flax, fax sorter uh, machine. So that would be the negative level or the, um, of expression of, of the given receptor labeled at the, the top here. This, this graph, you see two, two uh, dark peaks. Um, this turns out to be the native level which is represented by this um, stippled fax peak here. So those are cells expressing the native endogenous level of RB2. Now when we add the, um, the zinc finger transcription factor with a repressor domain, we knock out expression. So we take and infect a portion of those cells. And you can see that uh, that portion of cells now stains at the level of background. So we get a very strong knockout uh, with that protein um, and not a knockout of the other. <coughs> Irby family members. Now, if we go to Irby 3, we see that this is the native level. Knock it out, take it again back to the level of background. Furthermore, we can just change that effector uh, domain from um, a repressor to an activator and, either, and now grow out a population of cells over the native level here that overexpresses Irby 2, or over here that overexpresses from the native to this level. Or B3. So you have that ability to finally regulate um, in either direction using, using this type of approach. And the, the corresponding ERB family member to which these proteins have uh, greatest homology is, is not regulated. It turns out that these proteins, it's not that they don't bind those sites, but they bind at an affinity which is above the transcriptional threshold uh, for signaling in, in these systems. So they bind the uh, 15 out of 18 base pair sequence at about 10 nanomolar in this case uh, for the ERB2 protein binding ERB3 uh, as compared to slightly sub nanomolar for it, it binding its optimal site. And the similar behavior is, is observed for that protein designed to bind ERB3. It binds with slightly sub nanomolar affinity at its targeted site in, in the uh, 10 nanomolar range um, for the uh, off target site. And that allows us to have. Um, uh, transcriptional um, specificity with those those domains. Now, in my laboratory, we're applying this approach primarily to uh, therapeutic means. Um, this simply shows uh, retroviral delivery of a transcription factor that targets fetal hemoglobin into a an erythroid cell line, in that you can see that as the cells are infected with this um, targeted zinc finger and not. Um, this one, these cells turn red as they begin to express fetal hemoglobin. We've developed blocks to um, HIV uh, replication as well, and this is a block that we've installed in primary human um, PBMCs using a lentiviral vector, ideally to be able to impact um, um, AIDS um, with this type of approach. Does this work in whole organisms? We've looked at both Arabidopsis and tobacco. Um, in both cases, we've designed a single zinc finger protein to target a given gene. This is the site we targeted in Arabidopsis. This is the protein sequence um, targeted. That um, uh, AP3 gene was, was simply targeted because the, the corresponding phenotypes had been um, 
already described using um, more traditional approaches either to gene knockout or uh, overexpression. And the, the um, phenotypes that the zinc finger was able to achieve really uh, phenocopy those, um, the phenotypes uh, derived from other methodologies. So we can take a rather um, um, pretty Arabidopsis flower and now grow out more petals flowers is no longer as attractive as it was before we um, intervened in the system or um, teach it to to grow fewer petals and these 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 plants um, grow fewer petals as a result of our ability to repress specifically that that uh, transcription factor that's involved in floral differentiation ap3 now how might we be able to use this in a in a discovery approach or how might the synthetic biologist be able to use um, the well, uh, relatively well-defined system of zinc finger proteins and perhaps the undefined system of the biological unit to have a, an impact. Um, in this, this approach, we actually use libraries of transcription factors. So now that we can mix and match these in a defined region, uh, way to target a specific gene, one, one might now consider jumbling up these predefined domains and, and adding them to cells in mass to activate or repress every given gene in the genome and then ask now that cellular library to provide you with a given solution. And that may allow you to modulate um, interesting um, uh, metabolic pathways to give you uh, phenotypes and cells and, and organisms and to discover genes and biology that you might use therapeutically. And so um, instead of uh, looking at the DNA sequence and writing out the specific domains that, that you use in this approach, you simply jumble them up and deliver them using a library-based approach. And in mammalian cells, again, we've primarily used retroviruses, um, typically following only about two rounds of selection. And each round of selection involves infection and then selection based on either a surface marker or a phenotype that you're interested in for those cells, those few cells in that library now that have that phenotype of interest. And then since we're using retroviruses, um, this next round of selection actually involves recovery of that zinc finger cassette by PCR to get around any uh, integration artifacts that would come from that retroviral library, and then a second round of selection. Following two rounds of selection, most surface markers we've chosen to regulate are readily um, regulated using this approach. And again, the power of uh, transcription factors is that one may be able to have an easy way to select for activation and maybe turn out to be very difficult to select for repression. It may be um, um, something that's cytotoxic um, if one knocks out a given gene. But with the transcription factors, one can, can choose how one selects either positively. So this is a transcription factor we selected to positively regulate um, CD144. In, in this um, human cancer cell line. So we took it, a gene that was otherwise off in this line and turned it on via two rounds of selection in, in, in the cell line. Now if we want to go into melanoma where this, this gene may have relevance in, in metastasis and turn it off, this is the, the, the basal level of, of this receptor in, on a, a human melanoma cell line. We can turn it on using that same uh, receptor evolved in in this cell line, but we can also then turn it off. Number of phenotypes also are readily uh, visible when one creates these libraries. So when, in, in this case, um, a transcription factor um, was shown to, to cause sickling of this um, HeLa type cell, and if one clones that out and delivers it to a plate of HeLa cells, all the cells uh, achieve this phenotype. We're not exactly sure which gene um, this transcription factor ha is is regulated, or which um, family of genes it might be might be um, regulating. But you can see readily that this approach allows you access to a wide range of, of, of phenotypes. Some of the interesting phen phenotypes we're looking for are those that reside in um, uh, cancer cells and that teach cells to metastasize to certain parts uh, of, of the body. So it's, it's known that some cancers metastasize to to bone, liver, or lung, and we might be able to learn that um, by delivering these transcription factors into cells and then collecting uh, the cells from parts um, 
of the animal um, now where the transcription factor has taught the cells to, to migrate to. And um, you can see that um, cells after they've been selected in this, this manner, these are the, the, the starting population of cells. After one round of selection, the cells become very uh, metastatic. And it turns out we can directly decode or read the, this, the um, DNA sequence that that protein would bind, go to a gene array, and these are just duplicates showing that that protein does indeed bind that, um, that uh, designed or, or that decoded sequence. And then uh, with that, uh, purchase an antibody that would stain that marker and show that that marker is specific for that um, metastasis in those, those animals. So how might one use this in a synthetic biology approach? One might be able to use the approach to reroute um, biosynthetic pathways, particularly with, with three or four or five finger proteins. One could set these proteins down at, at individual um, uh, bifurcations of a biosynthetic pathway and turn certain um, um, uh, outputs off and facilitate those you would like to turn on to make your desired product. Uh, create novel and productive cell types. So there are certainly premier cells within our body, uh, plasma cells, which are very uh, adapted to making huge quantities of protein. Perhaps we can make any given cell into a, into a plasma type cell to produce very large quantities of a therapeutic protein of interest by, by simply turning on the genes um, that are required to change the phenotypes of, 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 of those cells to make them into, into really high level um, protein production machines. Now, given the, the fact that I only have about two more minutes, um, we, we've also adapted this approach to, to work with a variety of, of small molecules. So you can turn these switches on or off with about five different um, uh, chemicals at the moment by adapting um, known gene regulatory systems and by engineering others. And so in, in the engineering um, realm, we've re re-engineered steroid hormone ligand binding domains to act as um, monomers. So typically these, these um, steroid hormone domains are involved in a dimerization event, and that can be used to, to, to regulate genes wherein there's a, a symmetry element of, um, imposed on the site. But if one wants to get away from symmetry, and I think that's one of the advantages of using the zinc finger proteins, one has to learn how to make these proteins work um, not as, as uh, homodimers, but as, um, as, as basically allosteric machines. And we're able to do this by tethering together ligand binding domains with defined linkers. Now, that those linkers allow them to um, induce what might be seen as more of a conformational change uh, to allow them to direct the regulation of, of a given um, six-finger protein. The output of, of these types of switches can be seen here. Addition of an inducer now allows this um, estrogen-based single-chain switch that, that we designed to be responsive to tamoxifen. So we can turn the gene on. And again, we're overriding the endogenous regulation of this gene with this switch. And so this is the in, in, not a transgene which is being induced, uh, which is the typical output of any given um, switch of this type, but in an endogenous gene. So as we titrate in the, the small molecule, we can see a tremendous upregulation of, of, of the protein being expressed in the cells, or a downregulation. If we simply change that activator into a repressor, we can silence by the addition of the small molecule. And now there are a diversity of small molecules that can, that can be used. Finally, um, I, this is, I think, the last slide. Um, I think... Uh, You'll see in the future, and, and a lot of work is, 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 is being directed in, in, in the area of using these proteins, not only to turn genes on and off, but to actually do a specific type of work um, on the genome. And so there's pioneering work that, that started at um, Johns Hopkins in terms of making fusions with endonucleases, and that's now being translated into approaches that allow um, uh, homologous recombination to be facilitated to correct genes. Um, uh, a variety of laboratories, including my own, have been involved in directing integration, so we'd like to be able to integrate genes at specific sites and um, recombine um, certain sequences. I think you'll see these as um, devices in, in um, uh, nanotechnology as, as ways to link 
um, DNAs together to, to make uh, defined structures as well. And then finally, I hope I've convinced you that really any laboratory can use these domains as sort of off-the-shelf reagents and um, as synthetic biologists, ideally you'll be able to use those to, um, to address um, problems that you're interested in. And finally, to thank the, some of the individuals that have been involved in the laboratory that were key to the development men of, of this approach. Uh, David, Laurent, Karen, uh, Pilar, Torbjorn, and, and Scott. Three of these, these people are off now uh, with, with their own uh, laboratories. And, uh, and I've touched on a variety of other projects that also had collaborators, especially in the, in the plant area, uh, Roger Beachy and, and Stephen Briggs primarily. And since I always get this question, I'll, I'll put that slide up and now I'll ask your, your question, uh, answer your questions ideally. We have 10 minutes for questions. Let's start with uh, Roger right here. Oh. Uh, Carlos, uh, tell me if this is um, uh, on the, in the right track. Um, so um, if you had a zinc finger protein that bound only one, one and only one spot in the genome, then if transfection of a cell or an organism gave an interesting phenotype, uh, the, the cancer cell didn't metastasize, the, 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 the cell turned into a plasma cell or something like that, you could immediately, by finding its binding site, find the gene that was regulated. Is that part right. of what was driving you to push for uh, only one binding site per genome? That discovery aspect, but also the, the, the potential to, to impact uh, genes that we knew, knew we wanted, wanted to target. So the, the, the one experiment I showed that involved selection in animals, we were actually able to simply look at the domains that, were, um, the, that the um, selected zinc finger carried with it, decode those, uh, look at a gene array and, and establish that that indeed was the gene um, targeted. And so um, there is that potential. There's also the potential now for more complex phenotypes to use proteins that have fewer than six domains, so that one can hit a multiplicity of genes and get those types of phenotypes as well. And those will be harder to understand uh, how you're getting those phenotypes, but I think it gives you access to phenotypes that otherwise would be difficult to, to obtain. Synthetic biotropy. Right. Um, yeah, I, first a comment. Obviously, um, your um, large library of transcription factors would be a word. great, okay. um, yeah. Your library of transcription factors will be a great boon to those trying to construct large logic networks using transcription factors and tr using transregulation. So that's great. But my question is, um, affecting affecting chiral gene expression, especially in higher cells, is not just a question of specificity of a transcription factor, but the accessibility of the transcription factor to um, that sequence as it exists in chromatin. And um, the zinc fingers seem to be developmentally well behaved. That is, they respect the rules of silencing pretty well. So, um, uh, are you trying to address the uh, the, uh, the um, problems with, try with with getting at genes that may be silenced? Like, for example, by fusing your genes to uh, histone acetylase or something to see if that helps it get accessibility to sequences that may not be accessible. Right, uh, chromatin uh, certainly um, imposes defined barrier, barriers to given genes. However, that, that barrier is not complete and that one can find holes in, <coughs> within the, the chromatin to target a given gene and then open it up. And um, my laboratory, usually when we want to target a specific gene, we look for certain elements within that, that gene. Uh, we want the, the zinc finger to protein to be uh, relatively close to the the TATA box, ideally in the 5' prime UTR, maybe near a um, defined site that uh, it, it appears that another transcription fa factor may bind. And th those gives a, give us hints as to accessibility to a given site in DNA. Um, if that given site is not accessible, though, one can simply make several other proteins and, and find a hole, um, as we and, and Sangamo Biosciences primarily have done. And then the fact that one can use the libraries really allows you to saturate a given sequence so that all those proteins have the chance to, to find a, a hole in the gate uh, to, to, to turn on that gene that otherwise might be off. 
And we've turned on a number of, of what appear to be silenced genes, for example. We can turn on that um, transcription factor that's involved in flowering in the leaves of, of plants where otherwise it's silenced. Uh, we haven't looked at, at every possibility, so I can't answer that. Who is the microphone? Yeah. So, uh, can you like just highlight on the the sensitivity of all these 64 specific proteins? Like, do you think like all have very high binding constants? Like, no. The what we classify as the better proteins are those that recognize the GNN type sequences, and those are the types of sequences one sees these proteins primarily recognizing in, in nature. Uh, after that are the ANN uh, domains. Uh, some of those domains work just as well as the GNN domains, but the the recognition of um, polypyrimidine sequences with these proteins um, are, are 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 less good. Um, so there is a range. Um, but ideally, most of the domains um, you have enough enough flexibility that you can you can target any given uh, gene at least, um, perhaps not any given sequence with the de desired specificity that you might want at this point. Um, so what I, I should tell you is that I think all of these proteins work well enough um, for you to be able to use them in the laboratory. I think most of them could be further optimized as well, but that would be another uh, <coughs> several months of work in, in, in that case if you wanted to further optimize a given protein to recognize a, maybe a, what would be a very hard sequence to recognize. But you should also remember that you can also turn to the other strand and recognize that, which would have the easier sequences to recognize. So if you're able and not worried about which direction your protein binds to that sequence, you have that solution at hand. All right, let, let's take two more questions. We have Pam and one more. Um, I had a question about your FACTS experiment. I may not have, the data went by maybe too fast, but I was wondering about, it's an efficiency question. It looked like when you had the repressor domain bound, you got about 50% repression. And then when you had the activator domain bound, you got much better, it looked like more cells were activating. Is that just an artifact of the transfection efficiency, or are you selecting? Yes, so the, um, the transcription, the, um, the retroviral efficiency is really limiting in that case. But that is also a, a nice way to us to establish what is the, the basal level. So the repressor actually goes down to the level of, of zero. So if you take those cells and run them um, and do a Western blot, that protein band is no longer there. Um, so here, a little bit more than 50% turn out to be infected. So this combination is the 100%. These are uninfected. These are infected. Um, in the activation case, there are actually fewer that are infected. So there's there are differences in, in efficiency of, it, of infection, but that I don't think correlate with the domains we're actually delivering. OK, we have one more question back there. Is there a chance when you actually go into animals uh, that you'll have accidentally created an epitope which is immunogenic. Is, is that a, a hazard in this, this approach? Right. So um, these proteins are, are delivered at the level of, of DNA. So the epitopes we have to worry about are uh, T cell epitopes. The domains that, we've, that we work with are um, among the most common domains encoded um, in the genome, we use a consensus construct. The the probability is 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 low that we're going to develop a um, a T cell epitope based on where we focused our our mutagenesis. But you know, until that's done, um, we can't answer that question. But it doesn't appear that these sequences should have um, T cell epitopes in them. All right, I'm going to make one exception to the last question rule. We're going to have Carl Pabo ask a question, uh, since some of his, his work was on this, this presentation as well. So I know that you, um, you've checked this very carefully uh, in your own work to look at the specificity of the gene of interest versus alternative sites. I just wanted to mention another uh, parameter that may be useful in uh, comparison and, and control of sort of cellular circuitry, and that's just comparing the specificity for the target site with bulk DNA. I think that's sometimes a useful number 
you know, if you take the wild type ZIF, it depends, uh, you know, precisely on the experiment, but it's, you get specificities on the order of um, 30,000 or 100,000 to, to one of specific versus non-specific DNA. And I know that's work that uh, Keith Jung and Scott Wolf have also uh, continued. So it's, it's just another way that one can measure that that may be right. relevant as one tries to take these proteins and move them from one cell to the next. Not only look at the, you know, the one other alternative site you're thinking about, but the whole uh, genome in another way. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, let's thank Carlos again, please. So now we have a break for lunch. Lunch is set up in two spots outside. One is in the Ting foyer, which is where the posters were and the breakfast was this morning, and the other is down by where the registration tables were. Um, I also have another announcement. We have an addition to our schedule. We're going to have a breakout session over lunch led by Roger Brent over here in black. And um, it's going to be talking about uh, DNA logic and whether or not it's useful in cells. <laughs> so and um, so to kind of give you a frame of reference for the afternoon session, this morning we were kind of talking about parts and, what, and, and developing engineered parts for our synthetic biological systems. And we're going to be shifting gears now and looking at more at the organism level. Well, what kind of organisms would we want to run our systems in? And so we're going to be begin uh, with Tom Knight, my advisor, who will be talking about biological simplicity. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, you know it's uh, really gratifying to see so many enthusiastic people, uh, you know, in, in the audience. Uh, many years ago, we were, uh, you know, the, the field wasn't even named when we started uh, thinking about about this, and uh, you know, so it's uh, uh, you know really interesting to see the the level of interest and the level of enthusiasm, uh, you know, of the people here in the audience, and I hope in other places as well. Uh, I'd like to spend today, uh, this afternoon, uh, talking to you about uh, you know, my viewpoint as an electrical engineer and a computer scientist on uh, some biological systems. And uh, we often hear people talk about the wonderful, marvelous complexity of the natural world. And uh, I'm, I'm you know, a, a, an engineer by background, and the complexity of these systems really uh, you know, is, is something that uh, in the computer science world is, is pretty cheap. Uh, the thing that we tend to value is the simplicity of the systems and the elegance of the systems. Um, Leonardo da Vinci had the same idea. Uh, he, thought, he thought simple systems were pretty cool too. And uh, so what I'd like to do is to, to spend some time this afternoon talking to you about uh, one of the very simple systems that we're looking at. Uh, so the uh, you know, there's many different ideas of measuring uh, complexity of systems. So one, one way you could measure it is you could go and count how many molecules there were in a cell and how many different kinds of each molecule there were. And that might give you some idea of the complexity of the system. Another way you could measure it is you could measure what the complexity of the description for the system is. So I could figure out how many bases of DNA it took to describe some system. Uh, another way I could measure the complexity would be to build a functional model of the system, a, a, a system which did the same job as the, as the system I was trying to study, but uh, maybe was built out of different components or you know, thought about it in a different way, but it functionally behaved in a similar way. Uh, what, how, how big is the simulation for the system? And all of these are, are well-known ways of sort of measuring the complexity of, of systems uh, from an engineering standpoint. Uh, we actually heard about uh, Legos earlier this morning, and uh, so I, I, I brought some Legos with me. Uh, you know, these were my favorite toys, too. Um, and, you know, an interesting thing about Legos, of course, is that you get to put them together in whatever way you feel like. You probably discovered that when you were, uh, you know, four or five. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, though, mention about Legos is that, you know, there's different kinds of Legos. Uh, you know, if you're, you know, the dyed-in-the-wool engineer, you really like the gears on these Legos because they do things. And, you know, you put them in the right place, they actually perform some function. But, you know, there's a whole set of other people who really like the flowers on top. You know, the, uh, 
the doodads that you can get to put in, uh, you know, and the, the little people. And, uh, you know, so um, we're, uh, we're going to take a look at both kinds of pieces, uh, you know, as we start looking at some of these organisms. Uh, by background, I'm a silicon engineer, and uh, so and you can tell when I uh, got out of the business by the size of the wafer I'm going to show you. So this is ancient history for any of you silicon designers out there. I apologize, but this is when I stopped. Uh, <coughs> they're now about this big, you know, sort of pizza size. But uh, these systems are, are relatively complicated systems. They've got, you know, in this case, probably tens of millions of transistors in them. Uh, you know, modern, modern systems have hundreds of, of millions, uh, perhaps billions of, of transistors. Uh, the mask for that, the way in which we produce them, the lithographic systems have, uh, you know, have structure. But uh, if you look at them as a bitmap, you know, how many, how many megapixels do you have in your mask? Uh, you know, it's about a terapixel in, in the mask description for a modern integrated circuit. So there's a lot of bits in describing what goes into a piece of silicon. Uh, as electrical engineers and computer scientists, we have a grab bag of really interesting tricks to try to study these systems and to think about how, we, how these systems get constructed. Uh, powerful tools, powerful tools that let us isolate one part of the system from another, insulation between wires. Uh, ideas of modularity. You build systems out of subsystems, and the subsystems get built out of subsystems, and the sub-subsystems get built out of components. And then those components get built out of, you know, process engineering, and down at the bottom, maybe you've got some quantum physics. Uh, so there's this idea of hierarchy. Another very important idea, you know, you can see in the Lego world here, we have standardization. Uh, you know, if you've played with the Legos, you know that they fit together just about in any way you can think of. You know, these two pieces snap together, but, uh, you know, I, I can take these weird pieces, too, and, uh, you know, they snap together also. So, you know, I, I get to put things together, uh, and, and they basically fit. Almost anything you can do with a Lego makes something that fits. How does that happen? It doesn't happen you know, just sort of by falling off, uh, you know, because somebody, you know, made whatever they felt like and they fit together. It takes work to have that happen. They have to be standardized. Uh, we have ideas of abstraction. You know, we, we think about, you know, the behavior of pieces of, of, uh, of system uh, and, you know, promise ourselves that we don't look too hard inside of them the ideas of black boxes, and looking at the behavior of the system from the terminal standpoint. So all of these tools let us cope with the complexity of silicon. And uh, several years ago, I started taking a look at what we could do to try to leverage that from the standpoint of managing the biological complexity. So one of the things that, uh, that we did is something that I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this afternoon. Uh, but which is sort of a theme that's run through uh, several of the things that uh, have been said and will be said at the meeting, is this idea of standardizing biological components. Uh, Randy Retberg and, and I have been, uh, and Drew Endy, have been pushing this idea of, of a registry of biological parts, uh, parts which are standardized in terms of how they're physically put together, uh, how standardized in terms of their functional behavior and standardized techniques for measuring the behavior of those parts. And several of my students, uh, you know, Reshma has been working in this area, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Austin Chi has been, uh, been looking at some of the measurement technology and, and uh, you know, developing new assembly techniques. And so one of the focuses of my lab, which I'm really not going to spend much time talking about this afternoon, is in this area of biological parts. One of my other students, Jonathan Goler, will be giving a, a, a talk on, on Saturday uh, on the uh, CAD uh, you know, design tool for uh, biological systems that he's developing. But what I really want to talk about this afternoon is, uh, is this topic down in the bottom here of simple cells and simplified cells. So uh, what can we do in terms of taking the natural complexity of the world and reducing it by looking, by trying to think about biological systems that are naturally simple and then taking the next step from an engineering standpoint of intentionally reducing the complexity of those cells. Uh, 
So we'd like to have an engineered organism, which was simple and well understood, where we got in there to be a with an ability to change it and control it. And the strategy which, uh, you know, which we've been following for the last several, uh, several years now is to start with an existing simple organism and, uh, and then take things out until it breaks. Uh, and we'll look at the ideas of rationalizing the infrastructure of that system. Uh, I tend to think of this as the chassis and the power supply for the kinds of computer systems that we'd like to, the kinds of computational systems that we'd like to build inside of living cells. So they don't do much on their own, but they provide a spot which is understood and you know, capable that we can insert other modular uh, biological systems into. Just to remind you of where, where we are in the complexity uh, story, uh, Drew Endy is working with T7 Phage, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that as the meeting progresses. Uh, we're up here at three gigabases, uh, but uh, you know, the organism that we're looking at is uh, this one which you've never heard of before probably, uh, Mesoplasma florum, which is 793 kilobases. Uh, the organism which uh, gets a lot of press is this organism, Mycoplasma genitalium, at 580 kilobases. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a, it's a human pathogen, and we may say, say a few words about that in a minute. So some history of this class of organisms. Uh, you know, back in the, in the, uh, in the early 30s, uh, these organisms were called PPLOs, uh, and they eventually became known as Mycoplasma. Uh, the, uh, they were first identified by uh, Klinerberger Nobel in uh, 1958 as a free-living bacterial species. Uh, my interest really goes back to some articles that Harold Morowitz uh, put together, uh, you know, starting in the 60s, uh, where you know he he started talking about these as being the smallest living cell, uh, and the article which probably most profoundly affected me was one that Morowitz wrote in 1982 called "A Complete Understanding of Life," in which he basically proposed tearing apart this organism, or you know, actually Mycoplasma capriculum as a, a way of understanding all of the things that it would take to understand a simple living cell. Uh, you know since then that uh, Claire Frazier uh, sequenced, uh, and, and a bunch of other people at Tiger sequenced uh, Mycoplasma genitalium, uh, and later uh, did a transposon mutagenesis to figure out what the essential genes in that organism were. We were dominate. Our, our concern with uh, with choosing an organism was dominated by uh, by convenience of use in the laboratory, since we knew we were going to work be working with it for a long time. So one of the primary uh, things that we were looking for were uh, fast growth and and safety. Uh, as we run a laboratory with high school students and uh, and freshmen and uh, we wanted an organism which wasn't uh, going to cause any problems in the laboratory. So we were looking for a BSL-1 organism. Uh, the one we chose, I, I like to say, nobody cares about this organism. You know, the, the doctors don't care about it, the vets don't care about it, the plant pathologists don't care about it, nobody cares. And uh, only an engineer could love this organism. Uh, <clears throat> it's a uh, Fast growing, uh, which is in contrast to many of the other mycoplasma species, and it's convenient to work with. Uh, it has a small genome, which we'll see in a second, uh, less than a megabase. Uh, we know the sequence now, and I'll talk to you about how we got there. And uh, Greg Fournier uh, you know, and, and I spent uh, you know, the last couple of years uh, doing a pretty careful annotation of this organism. So we, uh, we know a lot about what it is. So here's a, here's a picture of some colonies growing. They grow small colonies, uh, about uh, 300 microns or so in 400 microns in diameter. Uh, this is an optical micro micrograph, which won't show you very much because the cells are small. They're about 400 nanometers. But uh, Grant Jensen at, uh, at Caltech has done some fabulous uh, 3D TEM pictures of this organism. This is a slice out of that. And in the middle, you can see that grayish area, which is the DNA, uh, the chromosome of the organism, compacted. This is about 400 nanometers in diameter. And uh, you know, we can see the individual ribosomes uh, you know, in this picture. They're the, uh, the small round dots, blackish dots, 
picture. That uh, thing on the right-hand side is part of the carbon support for the uh, TEM grid. So, uh, and, you know, uh, Grant uh, and uh, Elizabeth Wright in his laboratory, a postdoc in his laboratory, are uh, starting to look actively at, uh, you know, the cytoskeleton aspects of this organism, uh, partly because now it's, uh, it, again, it's a safe organism. These, these pictures were done in Germany, and the reason that this organism was chosen was because Germany has fairly, uh, fairly draconian import regulations, and they were able to get this organism in, unlike some of the other mycoplasma. So the culture medium is ridiculously rich, uh, it has everything you can know. The, the absolute requirement for eye of newt has not been shown, but you know everything else. Uh, there is a defined medium, which I haven't been able to get work yet, but uh, you know, Dr. Hackett here is going to help. He's here at the view. And he's been working with spiroplasma, a fairly closely related uh, you know, organism. The, uh, the defined media has uh, everything in sight, and uh, all of the amino acids, uh, all, of the, uh, all of the bases, the vitamins, uh, salts, uh, and the fatty acids. And that's because this organism basically can't synthesize anything. There's a, uh, it does almost entirely synthesis, uh, import rather than synthesis. And, uh, you know, there's a trade-off here in complexity between the import of uh, chemicals and, and the synthesis. So you need to have more import if you don't have the synthetic capability in-house. Uh, it has a pathetic amino acid uh, synthesis capability. It can take glutamine and convert to glutamic acid and asparagine and convert to aspartic acid. That's it. Uh, so. Uh, we sequenced the genome. Uh, in our lab, we did about 12% to see where we were uh, you know, in, in the organism, and then uh, did that with libraries, and yeah, I won't go through this. We, we looked at uh, you know, a good piece of this genome, around 12%, and we learned that they were all old friends, uh, nothing really surprising. Uh, looked at the origin of replication. And in 2002, uh, Eric Lander uh, agreed to uh, sequence the organism for us. And, you know, his comment was, well, that's great, but what do we do with the rest of the day after the coffee break? Um, and, uh, you know, that didn't really quite work out. It was a while before we got the draft. It was uh, November of 2002. Uh, we did a fair amount of work in our lab to close the gaps in the genome, and uh, you know, we did that. Uh, you know, there's uh, some difficult, difficult sequences, uh, but uh, you know, we, we managed to conquer it. Uh, these are the statistics on the genome. It has 682 genes, uh, protein coding genes. Uh, has uh, uh, no use of the codon CGG, uh, except for one place, which we think probably is a, a ribosomal uh, skip. Uh, completely classical circular bacterial genome, relatively clean. Uh, you know, the standard set of bacterial stable RNAs, uh, so no surprises. Uh, standard motifs, uh, you know, TG uh, extended minus 10, uh, you know, a little bit in the minus 35, but not much. Uh, standard RBS plus some unusual RBSs that have been found in some of the other mycoplasmas. Uh, Recently, I've identified some, uh, some riboswitches for thymine and for the T-boxes for upstream of the uh, uh, valine and uh, isoleucine uh, tRNA synthetase genes. This is a, a picture of the, of the, uh, of the genome, uh, you know, characteristics of the genome. The, the uh, RNA, ribosomal RNA regions are those dark regions with very, very high, relatively high uh, GC content in the genome. The blue and the dark blue and the and the dark red regions are the transcribed regions of the genome uh, and uh, show the two different gene orders. So uh, there's pretty much what you'd expect in terms of transcription direction, uh, coherence between the translation between uh, DNA duplication direction and uh, and, D and and DNA uh, transcription direction uh, of, the, of the genes. Uh, so origin of replication up at, uh, up at 12 o'clock. So we, uh, 
This uh, Greg Fournier did a, an amazing job of identifying the genes in this organism and constructing this uh, metabolic pathway. We've also done the ecopsych, uh, you know, implementation, the ecopsych version of the metabolism. Uh, there's uh, no surprises here uh, in terms of, of metabolism. Uh, it's a very, very simple organism without a lot of junk, and that was exactly what we were aiming for. Uh, things that are not here, these are, from an engineering standpoint, really good idea. No cell wall, no citric acid cycle, uh, essentially no amino acid synthesis, no fatty acid synthesis, one sigma factor, small number of DNA binding proteins, no selenocysteine. Uh, these are some things that we'll probably get rid of down on the bottom, and we'll talk more about that in a second. One insertion sequence, uh, you know, there's uh, one restriction system, and, uh, you know, there's uh, you know, something I want to come back to, which is that, uh, you know, there's shared function. Already we know that there's shared function for some of the proteins in this organism. This is, a, I think, an important point from, a, from an engineering standpoint, that People talk a lot about making minimal organisms. Uh, from an engineering perspective, you may not want a minimal organism. And uh, there's a, a trade-off between the number of components in the system and the complexity of the system, which isn't necessarily one-to-one. -one. A smaller number of pieces doesn't necessarily mean that the system is simpler. And so uh, what we're looking at is simple systems, ones that we can understand and have modular behavior and modular uh, you know, construction. Uh, let me give you an example of that out of, the, out of the engineering domain. Some of you may be familiar with the old style TVs before you got your plasma panel uh, that have CRTs in them. And the CRTs in them have a high voltage section, uh, but that high voltage section is shared with a whole bunch of other stuff in the system. It's shared with the horizontal deflection system, and it's shared typically with the high voltage regulator, uh, the high voltage uh, rectifier uh, filament supply. All of those things get are packaged into a small number of similar components. The horizontal flyback transformer does all three of those jobs. Now, that's great if you're building TV sets in Taiwan, because the cost of putting the TV set together a lot lower. It's terrible if you're trying to design it, and it's terrible if you're trying to fix it. And it's terrible if you're trying to understand how it works, because now pieces of three different systems have all been bundled together into one set of components. And that's an highly undesirable from an engineering standpoint. You'd really like to be able to pull those apart and maintain the modularity of the system. So we see similar things here in the bacterial world. We see individual genes that have more than one function. Is that minimal? Well, yeah, in some sense it is. But is it simple? And the answer is, well, no, it's not simple. We'd like to be able to pull back from that place and say, we've got one gene, one function. Where we're headed next, we're going to be doing a set of array experiments, which are uh, going to allow us to do a set of, of, uh, you know, of, of more or less traditional uh, things, more, find more out about the genome, uh, in particular find out the things that are being transcribed and what, what are pseudogenes and what are real genes. We're also going to be looking at a number of the close species, so uh, Bob Whitcomb, uh, who is uh, you know, the fellow that uh, was heavily involved in isolating and understanding these organisms back in the, uh, in the 80s, uh, has uh, a freezer full of about, uh, about a dozen or so other uh, isolates of this organism. Those and some closely related species, we're going to hybridize the DNA against the, uh, a, a whole genome array. One of the nice things about an organism of this size is you can make a whole genome array using NimbleGen technology with 10-base uh, spacing of the primers, uh, of the uh, oligos, and cover the entire genome uh, densely uh, in both directions, in replicate, with and without an intentional mismatch, and that all fits on a single array. So 
we can effectively sequence almost the the other other species that are close by we may not know where the genes are we'll know whether the genes are present in those other species so genes that are present in the organism we're studying but not present in the other species that are close to it are pretty good candidates for not being all that important um, Eric Rubin at Harvard Medical has come up with a really interesting technique which we are hoping to use for identifying the, uh, the essential genes, uh, essential at least under uh, you know, individually and under, uh, under lab conditions. And that technique called TRASH, uh, briefly what it involves is using transposon technology to insert a cassette into the genome at a random location. Uh, the uh, cassette carries an antibiotic resistance and an outward directed T7 promoter. The, uh, you grow up a bulk culture of, uh, of the cells, you prepare bulk genomic DNA, you use that DNA as a substrate for an in vitro uh, T7 transcript. The in vitro T7 transcript transcribes RNA outward from the T7 promoter into the genome from every one of the transposon insertions. Because the only place the transposon insertions can occur is in places which are non-lethal, the RNA only gets transcribed in those regions also. So the, uh, you take the RNA now and hybridize it against an array, and the things that light up on the array are the locations of allowed non-lethal transposon insertion events. So that, that allows you to do uh, a single experiment and, uh, and establish the, uh, the non-lethal uh, non, uh, genes in the uh, uh, transposon insertion events for the entire genome. So uh, George Church has been uh, you know, very successful at doing uh, proteome studies uh, you know, uh, along with uh, Jake Jaffe on a related, closely related species, Mycoplasma mobile. And uh, we're hoping to follow in, in their footsteps in doing a proteome for this organism as well. Some of the things that are sort of more on the engineering side uh, rather than the study side, uh, we need to get rid of the restriction system which is in this organism. It recognizes G GATC, and uh, it's rather inconvenient to not be able to put DNA in an organism with the sequence GATC. Uh, that actually is more common than you'd like. And uh, there's also no good plasmid systems for these organisms or recombination systems. So there's a, a, a lot of engineering work to get to the platform of, of, a, of a standard lab strain uh, of bacteria like E. coli. So a huge trade-off. Uh, you go for the uh, well-studied organism, and I suspect uh, we're going to hear a lot about that in a minute, <laughs> or do you go for the ones which are uh, start out being simple? So where we're headed is, uh, you know, we are going to be removing this restriction system. This is the first target of the recombination experiments. We'll be knocking that out. Uh, develop a set of recombination techniques, uh, you know, centered around the, the TET-M gene. We're looking for both a positive and a negative selection uh, in the recombination. So positive selection with uh, TET-M and negative selection, we're looking at the, uh, you know, the system developed uh, in Germany uh, using a modern mutant form of PS which, uh, which accepts parachlorophenylalanine. Uh, and that, that system allows you to select for the absence of, of specific genes. Uh, there are no known plasmids for this organism. Uh, there have been some based on the origin of replication, which is one of the reasons we went and sequenced it early on. Some closely related species, uh, Mycoplasma mycoides, mycoides has uh, two plasmids that are known. Uh, no one knows what keeps them around, so there's no, no particular, it doesn't look like there's any selective pressure to keep them around. They're small, they're the rolling circle kind of plasmids. Probably not ideal because they're probably not all that stable. Uh, what we're hoping to do is to reconstruct this genome and get rid of the unnecessary genes, remove the overlaps, standardize things, recode the proteins. Uh, you know, as the comment there at the bottom says, the code's four billion years ago, it's time for a rewrite. The, uh, the strategies we're looking at are either to 
collect all the good genes and put them together or to gradually take out the bad genes. And those are both well-known garbage collection techniques in the computer science world. Uh, we're pretty sure the first time we try this, it's not going to work. That, uh, that we're going to learn a set of chromosome design guidelines. Uh, that we're going to learn some new biology. That uh, the packaging of genes on the chromosome is going to be much more important than we think, than, than we realize right at the moment. At least that's my expectation. So some things that I'm looking for in terms of desirable simplifications, I want to eliminate the proteins that we don't need, all of the insertion sequences, the restriction systems. There may be entire pathways we can get rid of. Uh, you know, this organism is perfectly capable of uh, metabolizing sucrose and trehalose. Uh, we don't need that. Uh, we uh, certainly want to modularize the system by getting rid of the overlap genes and reorient things so that they're in the right direction. Now, uh, you know, that may not be important. It may not even be possible to see, see the previous slide. But uh, you know, it, it seems like that should be something that, you know, that if you're going to clean up the genome, you ought to go try to do. Uh, bring the genes that make sense together, you know, to put them physically close to one another so that I can pull them in and take them out as a cassette. Uh, Standardize the components. Uh, you know, uh, there's you know a zillion different promoters. There's a zillion different ribosomal binding sites and terminators. Uh, who ordered that? Uh, you know, we uh, you know we want we want uh, you know we want to to choose a small number at least of those or at least a small variety of them and you know standardize them. Uh, there's. I'm learning more and more about you know, weird regulation in this organism, things that no engineer could love. Uh, and you know, why, why keep those around unless there's a really good reason? Uh, more extreme, you know, can we get rid of some amino acids? So, you know, isoleucine, it, you know, you know <laughs> who wants that, right? Uh, Get rid of some of get rid of some of the codons. Uh, you know, there's you know extra tRNAs and extra codons, and you know, we can we can fix those. Uh, more extreme yet, uh, you know, we're going to hear about standard parts. Can we build a chromosome out of standardized parts? Can we you know get rid of some of the post-transcriptional RNA modifications and some of the protein modifications? There's some things we'd like to add too. Uh, maybe there's some great new amino acids that give us purchase in some areas that we don't have any right now. So, you know, some, uh, you know, cyanide groups or some acetylene groups on the, uh, on the tail end of some amino acid or perfluoro amino acid. Uh, can we explicitly code for cis and trans prolines? At the moment, you know, you code for one of them and then there's some enzymes that kind of mish them up and, you know, Maybe, maybe it's only one bit. You know, maybe you make a version of proline that really is in the cis form or really is in the trans form, and you, know, you code for it. And that might make things easier. I don't know. Uh, can we post translation? Can we code directly for the post translational modifications? That might make things easier. We put more bases in. I don't know. Uh, you know, if you uh, if we go up and uh, and Kiesling's lab, uh, maybe we can get the uh, pathway for producing, uh, you know, mint and uh, men methanol and, and menthol and, uh, you know, make minty, minty fresh mycoplasma. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's some good things that we can do. Uh, so I'd really like to thank a whole bunch of people. Uh, you know, over on the right are some of the people that have been involved in my lab and, and the other people here at MIT. Uh, you know, I've mentioned some of them along the way. Uh, some of the ones I haven't mentioned. Uh, Nick Papadakis actually set up our lab. He's now out on the West Coast. Uh, Ron Weiss is here. He was my first uh, first graduate student in this area. He's now down in Princeton. A whole bunch of our students, uh, you know, for the IAP courses. And over here on the left are some people that uh, that have been helping me in the in the mycoplasma world. Uh, Morowitz, who I don't know very well, but he got me started in all of this. And Greg Fournier, who I've mentioned. Some of the 
myco ancient history mycoplasmologists that uh, know more about uh, mycoplasma than I ever will, and the crowd at Whitehead uh, with Eric Lander and George Church always and Roger Grant are always interesting people to talk to. So, uh, so just in summary, uh, you know, an alternative an alternative to understanding the complexity of, of, of uh, things in the, in the biological world is to get rid of it. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm strongly in favor of that. Uh, this, uh, this approach complements the idea that you've got, uh, you know, that, that you can, uh, you know, that we can use standard biology. And uh, you know, it lets us, lets us learn new science in a different way, perhaps, but it also enables a set of novel engineering applications. Where's the, where's the hook? Use the hook. Yeah, it looks like cutting off your own advisor is kind of difficult. Um. <laughs> you just didn't make yourself visible. <laughs> right, right. <Flag>. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, why don't we start with some questions? Anyone? Uh, over there? I'm, I'm troubled by your conception of starting with an organism where you don't have techniques available or where you don't know you have techniques available. Um, and I'd like you to address that and also something on the metabolism. Um, you've chosen something that can't do amino acid synthesis. But if you have something that can do amino acid synthesis, then you can really grow it on minimal media and that offers a lot of advantages too. So can you explain the choice with respect to amino acid synthesis and also the choice about uh, available technologies versus committing to developing technologies? Sure, well, I think those are both excellent questions and, and certainly are some of the things that I stay up, uh, stay up late at night worrying about. And uh, you know, the, uh, I think the, the techniques issue is from my perspective more serious. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I think uh, there's been a lot of effort over the years in the mycoplasma community to develop good uh, recombination and plasmid uh, technology. Uh, that has paid out to some degree in the recombination area, and uh, in some of the species, it's also played out well in the plasmid area. So the spiroplasmas right now actually have a pretty good plasmid system, uh, plasmid system, and uh, you know recombination has been pretty effective in. Uh, in Galasepticlin and uh, in pneumonia, uh, but uh, yes, uh, that there certainly is a fairly major danger there. As far as the amino acids go, uh, I, I guess I'm less concerned about that because uh, you know we can always go in there and add add that synthesis in as a cassette. So we know I'm just going to go to J and I'm going to say you know give give me methionine synthesis. And I'm going to pick that up as a cassette, and I'm going to plug it in. And uh, you know, I, you know, I would like to think that that's the way it's going to evolve, rather than by starting with some system which is so complicated that we can't understand it, uh, and and then uh, you know, then having to go and remove those, you know, the complexity, you know, from a from a horribly complicated system. But I could be wrong about that. I, I don't. Know. We have a question down here. Um, how much do you care about robustness? If you take too much, well, for example, if you were talking about taking out trihalos and sucrose synthesis, presumably if you do that, you lose resistance to uh, toleration of dehydration. Um, do you, are you at some point going to end up with a, an organism that is so fragile that the moment the environment changes, it dies? And if that, in that case, you know, have you really got an organism at all? Well, I think that's another good question. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Certainly, our experience with things like coli, as you start knocking out genes does lead to organisms that are much less robust. And you know, so, uh, but we're going to learn something inevitably by doing that anyway. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll say the other thing is I don't really want an organism which is all that robust. I want an organism which if I look at cross-eyed dies. <laughs> Uh, you know, because I don't want this organism, you know, out there in the in the world at least yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take a question over here, and then Roger Brent. Okay, at what point do you uh, do you define a system as being s simple enough? I mean, you, you're talking about you know just 
don't produce amino acids, you're just going to give it all the amino acids. I mean, why stop there? You know, why not give it ATP? Why not give it NAD? Why not give it everything else? I mean, at what point does this thing cease being a living cell and becoming more like a, you know, a virus living in some cell-free extract? I mean, what's, I guess, this is more of a philosophical question, I guess, but I was just wondering if you have some thoughts on Well, there's a whole set stop. of those chemicals that don't really get imported very well in, across the membrane. So I would say, you know, things that get trans get, that are straightforward to transport across the membrane uh, and are relatively small molecules are fair game, uh, you know, in my mind. Now, different people draw that line at different places. So, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, some people would say, okay, viruses are simple. You know, all you have to do is provide cells for them and they grow great. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, not in that camp. A t t technical uh, design question. Uh, I assume the uh, the GATC restriction system is in there to uh, enforce uh, a measure of replicative fidelity, um, and um, that taking it out will, in fact, increase your mutation rate. Uh, how fast does this guy uh, mutate now? And what you know, each gene uh, has a knockout uh, every one in a hundred thousand organisms. And what do you think you could live with? in a good power supply and chassis. I don't think anyone knows what the mutation rate in this organism is. Uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, you know, there's isolates of this organism which appear to be very similar uh, that have been taken place across the entire western part of the U.S. So, uh, you know, it's not like... It's not, it's not one... Uh, you know, one isolate, one place uh, that, you know, and, you know, tremendously unstable. We, you know, it's a species, there's lots of isolates of it. The isolates seem to be relatively simple, uh, re so relatively just, similar. Take out the GITC, probably increase your mutation rate. What do you think you can live with? You'll, you'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. <laughs> right. Okay, we have um, a question up here. Yeah, hi, I'm Tom. Yeah. Um, first, I'd um, like to thank you for um, being one of the founders of this entire um, effort to build computational devices inside cells. I think you're one of the first people I ever heard talk about this. So um, second, my uh, question was related to the question down there, which, um, which, so my question was, what other macromolecules get into this? Can you transfect RNA into this? I actually think it's quite interesting for you to try to make the cell um, enter the twilight world between life and viruses or life in, in vitro. And uh, I mean, if you could get RNA into the cells, then you could um, eliminate whole systems um, at a time, uh, temporarily at least, and see how the thing works with, 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 with exogenously added um, RNA encoding for, um, say, in a whole, whole synthesis pathway or whatever. Uh, I don't know about RNA. Uh, yeah, it does have uh, the COMEC uh, DNA import system that's fairly common in gram positives, uh, but uh, that pulls in DNA, not RNA. I would imagine that RNA would be pretty unstable going in. Uh, any further questions? Oh, in the back. I could just shout. Do you know if uh, the CGG codon is uh, no, it's not. It's not a stop. Uh, it's, uh, you know, if, if, you, if it comes across that, it will just, uh, you know, just halt. And then there's, you know, you, you've got to do something to kick the ribosome off. It, it's not a, not a normal stop. It has no release factor. Oh, I think we have one more. Are there computational aspects of the research that are going to evolve in parallel to this experimental paradigm you've outlined? Well, certainly, certainly there's a, a strong component, uh, you know, as soon as we, you know, get, get to some more knowledge of the metabolism, then I think this makes a, a very interesting target for doing whole cell simulation, for example, uh, and, you know, flux balance in the cell. Uh, so I think certainly from that standpoint, uh, and, you know, at some point you'd really like, I mean, there's, there's a parallel efforts to crystallize all of the mycoplasma genitalium, uh, you know, proteins. So we're going to have structures for some pretty good matches to most of the pro important proteins in this organism, I would expect fairly soon out of LBL. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that. Okay, if there are no further questions, we'll move on.
So continuing in our vein of simple organisms and engineered... <laughs> Sorry, my bad. <laughs>